In an arid Chilean desert, scientists are building the world's biggest eye on the sky, appropriately known as the Extremely Large Telescope. The massive observatory will sport a primary mirror measuring 130 feet wide, allowing it to gaze at worlds orbiting other stars and study the darkest realms of the universe. I'm really excited today to have two guests representing the Extremely Large Telescope. We have Michaela Chirasolo, who is the ELT program scientist, and Susie Ramsey, who's the ELT instrumentation manager. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Becky. Thanks to you. Nice to be here. I love that the European Southern Observatory has these names for its telescopes. We had the very large one, and now we have the extremely large one. <laughs> So can you just start by kind of describing how extremely large are we talking here uh, with this new telescope in construction? The extremely large, it's a 39 meter primary mirror. So we always talk about telescopes in the size of the, of the main mirror that we have and ours is 39 meters, which makes it five times in diameter, bigger than the current biggest um, telescopes that we run. So indeed, extremely large is very well named, if not very imaginatively named. <laughs> In terms of, you can think in terms of dimension, is like as big as the Colosseum in Rome, right? It's 100 wow. meter in diameter, and it's twice as tall as the Colosseum. It's 80 meter tall, right? So you are building a huge cathedral, but at the same time, that huge cathedral has to move and maintain the quality of the optics to nanometer accuracy. It's kind of mind boggling to think that something so big, as you're mentioning, big as the Colosseum, will it be literally the largest uh, uh, telescope of its kind in the world? It'll be the largest optical and infrared broad-based telescope. Right. So something like, you know, Arecibo before uh, it, it had its crash or FAST. Those are radio telescopes that are bigger, but in the optical range, 39 is just way beyond what we have so far. Yeah. And can you just get into a little bit how much more sensitive this is going to be because of that enormous uh, primary mi mirror? So we've got 25 times more, as much collecting area. So we will basically get 20 time, 25 times as many photons. For example, if we're studying galaxies in great detail, we can do that in our nearby universe where we get some particular sample of the galaxies that are nearby, but we're going to be able to go to the next biggest clusters of galaxies, for example. So we'll really take sort of that kind of step and to be able to see um, with, with the increased sensitivity that we have, to be able to study different environments for galaxies. So far, the, the technology was improving by a small step every time. You go from one meter telescope to two meter telescope, mm -hmm. from two to four, from four to eight. So the, the gain was always, was good, but was marginal. Now we do one, in one single jump, we go from 80 to 40. Right? You're going to be so much further out in, in understanding the stars. So bigger mirror means sharper images. And you're going to be also so much better in their, what we call angular resolution. So how sharp the image can be. And I know everyone loves the Hubble Space Telescope, right? We all love those pictures. Yeah, we, we're so familiar with those Hubble Deep Field images. And so to imagine that we're going to get such an, a, a sharper set of, uh, of gallery images from this is so exciting. I just wonder if you guys could talk a little bit about how it is going to be able to really help to characterize some of, uh, of the habitable zone worlds around other star systems, especially the, the kind of really difficult ones like Earth-sized worlds. The holy grail of the exoplanet, right? Having a big telescope, which is able to collect these very few photos that get to us, and in these photos, we have to be able to get these mini tiny signatures of potential biomarkers. So that means that in that atmosphere, there are specific molecules that can only be produced by, let's say, living, uh, uh, let's say, plants or, or uh, bacteria or, or people. And the target of the ELT is to characterize them, to really pick them, the most interesting ones, and see if in their atmospheres, some of these molecules really are telling us that there is something going on there, which is not just pure natural phenomena, but there is something that produces some ozone or some specific molecules that can only be produced by life. How compelling that biosignature would have to be, like if can ozone or methane, is that ever produced abiotically? So you try to see 
if yourself you can find a way to discredit that, that thing and this if that becomes to, to remain the last and only option that it's it's let's say a stronger uh, signal and what you also have to do is to understand your systematics of your instrument itself because you might see something and you believe is there but actually is in your own atmosphere or is in your own telescope that's producing some mimicking features oh look at that's fantastic no actually it's you because you have a grain of of dust on your mirror that produces exactly the same signature by chance right So in that sense you have to be super careful of all the systematics of all the way you control your experiment. So there's a lot to work, but super exciting, right? If there were a very compelling detection, say it's some earth-like planet that's a thousand light years away or something, um that's such a different thing than finding fossils on Mars or microbes on Europa, right? That's so far away. How do you think um people would react to that type of an extraterrestrial detection knowing that it's we we can't really go there how is that distinct <laughs> from the solar system maybe <laughs> slightly relieved <laughs> cool that there's other life out there but kind of handy to know that they're not going to come and you know shoot us with laser gun laser guns <laughs> on the other hand of course you know the friendlier ones amongst us might miss the opportunity to actually go and say hello and learn things from the extraterrestrials but i could imagine a whole range of a <laughs> reaction to that discovery <laughs> as as the ELT is able to kind of get a sense of what these atmospheres look like will that then and kind of inform the next level of surveys to try to look for similar um biosignatures or or potential biosignatures when the first exoplanet was discovered 51 Pegasus b it was completely a surprise you know they discovered mm. a planet much earlier than they thought they would in the experiment that we were doing because the planet was very different from what we thought planets would be like So then of course everybody changed their mind about what sort of experiments to do and what would be possible so this is definitely um it's all part of the fun right so yeah. when when you prove that there is a potential habitable planet first of all it's up as a philosophical things for humanity right it put ourselves in a completely different mindset already just already finding it you know, a lot of philosophers that might have to rewrite their own books right because that's completely change things But then also for, from our perspective our frontier today is to see if these these exist and then the next step would be to character, characterize them even more to get to more detail those atmospheres so instead of an extremely large telescope we might want to go to what we initially called an overwhelmingly large telescope <laughs> you know if you know but initially the, the ELT was born as a 100 meter telescope not a 39 and they were jumped to an overwhelmingly large telescope name and then due to you no know, technology but also understand that you know making a jump from 8 to 100 will maybe a bit too much so let's get halfway through first so um how much further back will a telescope with this kind of huge mirror be able to see and what are some of the new discoveries that that might entail so you go 500 times or faster in getting the same objects or you can go 500 times deeper into the understanding of all the things and this will apply both to our neighborhood so you say okay that's easy to do no because the very faint objects in our neighborhood also are unreachable today so with ELT we can be able to go down 13.5 billion years into the history of the universe and everything in between so you can really understand how the galaxies that you see today were built in the past mm-hmm. the physical conditions 13 billion years ago 12 billion years ago that allowed little clumps of gas to condense but also at the same time to change their chemistry because as you form stars the stars evolve and they die then re-enrich the material with which you regrow again the next generation next generation of stars and you can do this at every single epoch back in time back to when you had the very very first stars to be formed in the universe. So that's why you need the ELT. You need to be able to see small things, but these things are very faint, so you need a big collecting mirror to be able to find them and study them. One of the things that I think is very exciting is ELT's ability to help to clock the accelerated expansion of the universe. Could you kind of give us some background on um why that rate is is a little unclear and how ELT could help to make it more clarified? With the with the study of supernovas, 
we, we found that the universe was actually accelerating, right? Then we start having other methods like studying the what's called baryonic acoustic oscillations, the age of the clusters. The results don't really agree. None of these measured e measurements is really a direct measurement of the expansions. So with ELT, what you can do is a measurement which is orthogonal to all of them. It's completely independent of all these other way of measuring it and is somehow a more direct way of measuring without any assumption somehow. The idea is to look directly at the expansion as it goes. And the idea to do this is to pick up few distant objects, few quasars, and observe them at intervals of, let's say, 10 or 15 years. So you observe it today, then you observe them in 15 years. And if really there is an expansion of the universe, you will see some specific lines of these things moving. Mm. just because the universe has expanded, nothing else. And um, I wonder if you could actually tell us a little bit more about this amazing environment in the Atacama Desert, a place that European Southern Observatory has has a huge number of, of interesting instruments and, and telescopes. Why is this such a great place to build a telescope? One of the main things is the, the height and the, the VLT telescopes, the very large telescopes, they're all you know, built on a, on a mountaintop and our, our new telescope, the LT, is going to be built on a hill called Cerro Amazonas because it gets us above quite a lot of the atmosphere mm -hmm. and in particular for um, observing in the infrared wavelengths. So the further up in the atmosphere you can get and the drier it is, um, the more of the signal actually penetrates from the stars, galaxies, whatever actually to the telescopes. It's quite a challenging environment to work in. High and very, very dry. These are the key things to look for when you're choosing your uh, observatory of choice. Has the ground been broken yet? It's been under construction for quite a few years now. So the first thing that happened was that we had to take the mountaintop that was kind of shaped like this and flatten it to have a platform with the telescope on. It's really moving along um, and we have things like um, seismic protection uh, because of the earthquakes in Chile and those sorts of systems are starting to get built into the foundations. Could you tell us, yeah, a little bit more about the structure of the telescope itself? So what we have done, we have embedded inside the telescope what's called adaptive optics. So we do, we look at a star, we know that a star has to be a point, but we see it moving, we see it blurring, we see it distorted. And what we use are the what's called deformable mirror. It's a mirror which looks like on the surface as a, as a normal mirror. But in reality, it's made of a very thin shell, very thin, 1.9 millimeter thick. And behind, we have more than 5,000 actuators, 5,000 motors, that at a rate of 1,000 times per second, are able to change the shape of this mirror to compensate for any vibration or any turbulence in the atmosphere. Until you could build these amazing mirrors, until you could do those calculations on a you know, fast, fast, fast computer, then you couldn't actually use the technique. But now we can use it, it delivers amazing scientific results. So it lets us stay on the ground, but then also build these very big mirrors, because of course, you know, the space telescopes, they're always smaller because you have to launch them into space, at least until now. They are, for the size of the telescopes, we're talking about instruments which are the size of a small house. They are literally surrounded by scaffolding with stairs for the um, engineers to go up and down if any, you know, any valve needs read or, or motor needs changed. These are not all built um, by Michaeli and I. <laughs> They're all built at, at different places around the world. So we have teams of hundreds of engineers and scientists working on these instruments. Well, it'll be wonderful as the public getting to see some of these amazing things. What are some of the next steps and, and when do you expect to start to get observations from ELT? Today we are further advanced into the construction and what we foresee today is to have first light in 2027. It seems far away, but for us it's tomorrow morning.